evening, Grace Baptist Church. Welcome to our midweek service. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to the third chapter of Romans, verse 21. Romans 3, 21. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference. For all sin and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth to be a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed and to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Our Abba Father, we just thank You tonight for Your Word. We pray a special opening of our minds and our hearts and our ears tonight as we listen to Your Word and Your glorious Gospel. We pray for those saints that may have become discouraged and that through your gospel you would em empower them to overcome whatever that they are discouraged about. We pray if there's anyone listening that has not come to Christ that you would quicken his heart and that he would be made alive to believe in the gospel. We ask tonight that we hear the soft sound of sandals feet, that we see Jesus in Him only. We pray these things in His mighty name, through the power of the Spirit. Amen. Before we get started tonight, I want to give credit where credit is due, that some of the things I'm going to be proclaiming tonight are a reference to Paul Washer. They're not word for word, but if you've ever listened to him, you'll know where I got this. And I'm going to give him credit. I don't know where he got it. Maybe it's in-depth study. Maybe it's a commentary. But tonight, I want to pay special, at least to start with, verse 23, where it says, Falling short of His glory. Saint, preacher especially, we will never preach Christ as He ought to be preached. We will never know Him well enough in this age or in the age to come. He is God. He has all knowledge. We will never have all knowledge. Our tongue will never be refined enough that we can give Him the glory that He deserves. I've heard many eloquent preachers but none of them can give Christ His due. Only the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son can do that. If we track Him through eternity, and we will, we will just begin to know Him, as John Newton said, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've only begun to know Him. And that's what it's all about, is knowing Christ and making Him known. That's why eternal life begins with knowing Him. It's not knowing about Him. There are many people that know all the doctrines and they know Christ not at all. And when they stand before Him, He'll say, I never knew you. But, but, but didn't we? And we know that He will say, I am your judge, not your brother. If we truly understand Romans 3.23, we would crawl on our knees and beg for mercy. But we, saints, drink iniquity like water. We see this in Job. If God puts no trust in His saints, and the heavens are not pure in His sight, how much less man who is abominable and filthy who drinks iniquity like water. Yes, that's our plight, is it not? 
we see in Psalm 42. This should be when we see Romans 3.23. When we see that and we know our need for Christ, we would be as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. I want to know you. I want to be with you. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? We know that is a prayer of a saint. No ungodly person wants to appear before God because he knows what is waiting for him. If only we believed Romans 3.23, we would pant for Christ. We would long for Him. We would hunger for Him. The question, non-saint, for you is not, are you a sinner? But do you hate your sin? Sinners do not hate their sin. They love their sin. It's not, do you want to pray a prayer, but do you repent of your sin and believe the Gospel? And we see here in verse 24, being justified freely by His grace. Justified. Some people say that's just as if I had never sinned. It's more than that. Being saved is more than just being pardoned. It's having a positive righteousness. We see in Romans 4, Verse 3, what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. We need positive righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies or declares righteous, the ungodly. Who? The ungodly. None of us are godly apart from grace. His faith is counted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness. It means counts righteous apart from works. He imputes Christ's righteousness to us. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord will never impute sin. He does not count our sins because He counted them against Christ and treated Him as a sinner so He could count us as righteous and treat us as righteous. Joseph had a coat in the Old Testament in Genesis that his father gave him and he would not share with his brothers. Christ has a coat that He shares with all of His people. Listen to this in Isaiah 61.10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of His righteousness. Yes, the Lord has clothed us with His righteousness. We can stand before God righteous. Did you know, and this is hard to believe, but it says in verse 24, by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Did you know the natural man hates grace? And many saints don't fully understand it. I admit I don't fully understand it. Each day I see new mercies, new grace from God because the sinner sees his sinful self without hope if he believes in grace. Do you get that? If, if you know there's grace there, you have to admit that you are hopeless and helpless before God. And we cannot find any self-righteousness that would present ourselves to God on our behalf. And apart from grace, the lost man, woman, proudly go into eternal condemnation because they do not want the grace of God. They reject the grace of God. 
the wrath of God abides on them. But he says, but redemption. In uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 17, verse 15, listen to this. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Isn't that what God did to us? He justified the wicked. We see that in Romans 4. Listen to this. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Okay, listen to this. 17. He who justifies the ungodly and condemns the just. Isn't that what God did? He declared us righteous and condemned His Son who is just, who is fully righteous. That's exactly what He did. How did He do that? How was He able to do that? Well, we look in verse 25 of chapter 3. Whom God, talking about Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, set forth, placarded, put on a billboard as it were. 2,000 years ago, Christ hung on a cross suspended between heaven and earth, taking upon Himself the sins of His people. Publicly, after a living a life, a perfect life, and instead of a private execution, it was a public execution of Christ for the old covenant sins. That's what he means here when he says, God set forth as a propitiation, that's a mercy seat, that is an atonement, by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance, that means the past sins of the Old Testament saints, God passed over those sins that were previously committed. He's not talking about our sins before we came to Christ. He's talking about the Old Covenant sins who had been looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. They didn't see all the pieces, but they looked forward to it. When He did come, they rejected Him because He was not what they thought the Messiah should be. But some did believe into them because of His grace. Listen to this. He gave them the right to become the children of God. Not by their will, not by their good works, but by His will and what He was going to do in Christ. So he passed over those sins because in the Old Covenant they were slaying lambs and bulls and goats to cover sins. And it was like writing a check. And on that day, 2,000 years ago, God made those checks good. He redeemed them. Redemption. That means he saved them for a price. The price of his son's blood. You are a blood-bought person if you are in Christ. You are not there by your own effort, but by God purchasing you through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Then in verse 26, listen to this. To demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. That's us. We're under the new covenant. The old covenant is gone. He ended it by fulfilling it so he could start a new one. And we are all in the new covenant. I want to show you something again in Job. You know, Job is the oldest book, they think, in the Bible. And we've already seen about the iniquity of man. But listen to this. Job 14, verse 13. 
Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past. What does that mean? He's looking forward and seeing Christ on a cross and God pouring His wrath out on Him. And He said, Hide me till your wrath is spent on Christ so that I can be saved. That you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait till my change comes. You shall call and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. For now you number my steps, but do not watch over my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and you cover my iniquity. What great theology Job wrote, or whoever wrote this book, in the oldest book. Looking forward to Christ. Every page of this book has Christ in it. Look and see and find Him. And we see this in Romans 4, 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And we know that Job believed this because in chapter 19, verse 25, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Do you see the hope of Job? The hope of the second coming of Christ, your Redeemer? When we look at Christ, we find Him to be the only qualified person to represent both God and man. We see in 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. He is God and He is man. I want to read from the Christian Standard Bible. The first chapter, part of the first chapter of John. I'm not going to read all the verses, but I want to read enough of them so we get who we are talking about here. John 1:1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. Who is the Word? We will see in a minute. And this Word was with God, was face to face with God. And the Word was God. So the first thing we know about the Word is He is God, as well as God is God. We're not talking about two gods here. We're talking about two persons. He was with God in the beginning. That means as far back as you want to go, the Word was. You go all the way through eternity and there was never a time, as Athanasius said, that He was not. All things were created through Him. Apart from Him, not one thing was created and that has been created. We see in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. The Word created the heavens and the earth. The Word was with God face to face. Then we see in verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory. We beheld His glory. The glory of the unique Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the Word. But there was a time when He was not human. But He took on human flesh so He could be like us and be our mediator, be our substitute, and stand before God in our stead. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from His fullness. The law was given through Moses. It was given to Him, but He didn't originate it. Grace and truth came to us in Christ. No one has ever seen God, the unique Son who is Himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed Him. Yes, He has revealed the Father to us. He is a perfect man. He said, I always do what the Father wants me to do and I please Him. We see in Psalm 40, 
sacrifice, this is the prophecy of Christ, in offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written to me, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. And the writer to the Hebrews in the 10th chapter quotes this. He doesn't quote it from the Masoretic text, which this is based on, but from the Septuagint. He said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. He took away the old covenant, the sacrifices and offerings of the old covenant, and he established the second with his own death, his own sacrificial death for his people. I have come to do your will, O God. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. If you're in Christ, you've been sanctified. Quit trying to do what has already been done for you. Then we see in John I don't know why I don't have this in here. Maybe this is it. <laughs> yes. John 8. He who sent me is with me. This is Jesus talking. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please Him. He did this for us. He did this for the Father. It was to vindicate the justice of God by dying in the place of sinners. The eternal only could bay could bear the penalty of an eternal crime. When Adam sinned against God in the garden, he sinned against an eternal person. We either have to stand eternally condemned for that, or an eternal person has to take the penalty for us. His life Somebody asked Paul Washer one time, he said, I don't get it. How can one man stay on a cross for three hours and pay for the sins of all the people that are saved? And Paul told him, because that one man is worth more than the whole rest of us put together. And I would add to that the whole universe put together. Is Spurgeon's verse, which is Isaiah 45, 22 and 23. He was saved by this verse. I've modified it. It says, Look to me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. Then he says, Because at my name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Well, this is before Christ came. But we know in Philippians, the second chapter says, at the name of Jesus. Okay, Isaiah says, At my name, look to me, Yahweh, my name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So I'm going to modify the verse to read this. Look to Christ, all the ends of the earth, for He is God. He will save you. Come to Him, because at His name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. As we get toward the end of the Scriptures in the book of 1 John, the second chapter, second verse, it says, He Himself. Let me go back and read the first verse. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. That's our advocate, the righteous one, who has clothed us in His righteousness as we saw in Isaiah 61. He Himself is a propitiation, the mercy seat for our sins, 
and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That doesn't mean everybody's saved. It means He is the only propitiation whereby men can come and be saved from the penalty, the power, and the presence of their sin and have fellowship with God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I would urge you tonight that you have looked to Christ, that you continue to look to Him each day. And if you have not, to look to Him today and be saved today if you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Go in grace and peace. May the Lord multiply His blessings unto you. Amen.